On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Venus, and Venus was enmeshed with her abusive mother. It's a story of mixed messages, programming, plausible deniability, MDSA, and narcissistic fleas. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and with me today, we have Venus. How are you? Good. Grateful to be here. Well, thank you for being here, Venus. And if you want to be a guest like Venus is today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. There, you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. So today we are going to hear Venus's story in a big content warning for this episode. We discuss mother-daughter sexual assault in this episode and child sexual assault in this episode. There is a brief mention of physical abuse as well as animal abuse in this episode. So a big content warning on that. And also this episode with Venus changed our show in relation to our guest form and intake. And there are now more warnings on our guest form in our intake form when you go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. And that is because of trauma. And as far as trauma goes, this show is not a trauma-informed process that we go through. It is not a trauma-informed process. And we ask people to dive right into their trauma. And some people think that they are ready to do so when they actually aren't ready for it at all. And when Venus was going through our process, it was about six months ago, she was writing out her story. And within that time, she ended up having a seizure. So for everyone who is going through this process, we always ask you to ask your therapist, consult with someone, have someone to talk to after you start taking notes. So for everyone going through this process now, we we now ask you to consult with uh, your therapist first and to have someone to talk to after you start taking your notes. So when it comes to Venus, after this six months, uh, Venus contacted me again, and she still wanted to be on the show because she just really wanted to help validate and educate everyone in her community with her story. So a big, 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 big thank you to Venus uh, for being here. And now I'm going to get out of my way and your way. Venus, the floor is now yours. Yeah, thank you, uh, first of all, for having me and um, being patient because I needed to wait six months until I was cleared after having the seizure. Um, But I have been cleared and I am ready to tell my story. Uh, My story is about being raised in what I call a cult, uh, the cult of my mother's narcissism and rage. Um, And it's also about how until I was 28, I really took the bait. I fell for the cult. I was in the cult completely brainwashed um and how therapy in my late 20s uh was able to slowly pull myself out of the cult and now I am completely out of it and my life is completely different for the better so a little backstory um my mom is the main narcissist in my life who has a victim mentality she also has intense rage fits tantrums I would say that's a big part of my trauma story how she used her rage as a manipulation Um, she would use projection and shame to manipulate as well and plausible deniability is a big part of my story it's a big part of how she used not just myself but my entire family Um, she's also an alcoholic and she struggles with an eating disorder um, lots of black and white thinking 
She was also raised in a maternal narc family, um, as was my dad. I'll get to in a second. Um, and she did have childhood abuse. Uh, she was neglected from as, as far as I can tell from the stories. Um, and I believe that my mom is stuck at two different ages. The first being when she was three years old and molested. And the second being when she was 14 and her grandmother, my great grandmother was murdered and raped. Um, and my mom can revert to those two ages, both three and 14 any moment's time. My dad, uh, who is still with my mom, also came from a maternal narc family. Uh, and he lived with his mother, his parents, until he moved out to marry my mom. So he's never not been under the control of a maternal narcissist. A little more backstory that I think is important. Uh, my mom is white and blonde and blue eyed. She was very thin growing up. Uh, my dad is Mexican and short and a little stockier, um, not super dark, but definitely dark, has dark hair. Um, and racism is a piece that has a theme all the way throughout my story as well, which is why I think that those hierarchies are really important to understand. In my family, men are scapegoated. There's a huge gender role that goes on in my narcissistic family roles. Uh, they are consistently told that they need the women and are completely helpless on their own. This starts, you know, from birth pretty much. Um, and then it manifests itself and the men um, become enablers. They serve the female narc, uh, but they simultaneously get taken care of financially. And they're kind of, I would say they fall somewhere between like a lost child and a scapegoat. If you know your, your narcissistic family roles well. Um, the women are either vying to be the lead narcissist or they're serving the lead narcissist, which is what I did uh, up until my late 20s. Uh, you give everything to the narcissist or the family, your emotions, your time, money, planning, elaborate gifts and parties, constant attention, validation, all of that. And you're supposed to be waiting in line to become the lead narcissist, to, be, to have that role. That's kind of like the gift that you get at the end of, of taking all this abuse. And because of that family role, women in, the, in my family take on all of the other narc family roles. So you're the flying monkey, you're the caretaker, mascot, the golden child. And that was definitely my role. Um, I was constantly going back and forth between uh, being the mascot and trying to cheer everyone up literally dancing in the living room during commercials to distract from like the tension after a fight um, to going to my brother and trying to cheer him up after my mom would pick on him or my dad um, trying to reassure him after an explosion of anger. I was also the golden child because I was a straight A student and I really didn't ever get into trouble. It was really easy for my mom to take those things and um, make them her own because we were so enmeshed. And even though I was the golden child, I still would sometimes get scapegoated. My mom was really good at kind of oscillating between the roles. And it was only myself and my brother. I only have one other sibling. So uh, because he was the lost child, I kind of jumped between caretaker, caretaking my mom's emotions, my dad's emotions, to mascot, trying to cheer everyone up, to golden child trying to please her that way. Um, I, I jumped and tried to do anything I could to stop the rage, stop the, the abuse. To back up a little bit and just give you a kind of paint a picture of what a day in my household was like. Uh, my mom was in control of everyone and everything. Uh, she would constantly complain about everything. So she might come home from work and there's some dishes in the sink. And that could just make her snap from perfectly okay to screaming obscenities. Why the fuck are these dishes here? Nobody does anything. You're all lazy, mother bleep, 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 bleep. Um, she would uh, throw things, hit people. One time she threw a remote through a TV because the price of an airline ticket had gone up over two days and that angered her. 
she literally threw a remote through a TV. Uh, this was later in life. Uh, she's an alcoholic. So my dad and my brother and I would constantly just be trying to ease her and bring tensions down. And um, wine was the method. Uh, so my dad would, you know, pour her a glass of wine, open the bottle, and then go and hide. Uh, and so there was definitely neglect going on. Uh, my dad pretty much spent most of my childhood hiding from my mother and was very submissive, uh, enabling. Uh, he would literally tell me, like, oh, your mom's just overreacting. Like, uh, sometimes he would tell me, like, go comfort your mom. Uh, don't listen to her. Like when she would go down rants and spells about how horrible everything was, how horrible her life was, how her husband wasn't making enough money. Um, I would often get thrown at her. My dad would use me as a shield um, to protect him and the rest of the family. And I really took it. I believed all of her victim mentality. I believe that she had this really hard, challenging life that um, nobody seemed to see or seemed to help her. And so, you know, little six, seven, eight-year-old me took it on to try to solve all of her life's problems, um, which of course I later realized were, you know, half made up. I was extremely enmeshed with my mom. I think enmeshment is a big part of my story. Um, I was not allowed to not be like her or not be with her. So while most kids might go uh, on a play date and go, you know, hang out with their friends, even once I became a teenager, I was expected to be with my mom all the time. I hung out with her and her friends. I would hang out while they drank um, and basically emotionally support them. Uh, I was always alone when it came to things that were like challenging. So feeding myself, taking care of myself. Um, you know, as a child, I did my own laundry, made my own food for the most part, um, all of that. So there was, there was neglect, even though she was always around. She was around only so I could caretake her and not the other way around. Uh, in many ways, I kind of joke that I was her mother. And there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, and then there's my brother. My brother is older. He's five and a half, six years older. And uh, he was overweight as a child and dyslexic and just not like amazing in school. He wasn't horrible, but wasn't like a straight A student. And so there wasn't much that my mom could kind of glom onto and claim as her own in a way that gave her good like social credit. And so she really, she scapegoated him a lot the same way she scapegoated my father. And my brother became the lost child. He would literally just hide in his room in a very similar way that my dad did. I think it was very much taught to him. And by the time he was like a preteen, he was really into video games. And I've since learned that uh, he used video games as a way to dissociate and a way to disconnect. And I honestly don't know if he would have made it through our childhood if he didn't have that disassociation. Um, so I'm glad he had it. You know, I went the other way. <laughs> I went serve until until death. So I was hypervigilant, um, a mesh servitude. And during this time, I developed a binge eating disorder. Um, I would binge eat in, in silence. I would take food and hoard it to my room and then eat well into the night. And this is as a young child. I realize now that that was a form of disassociation. It was a form of comfort and a form of safety that I didn't have coming from parents who were supposed to be providing that to a child. Both my brother and I, as children, I always joke that we were raised by television. Uh, there's a lot of truth to that. We're, we are both children of the 90s. Who are, you, who are your TV parents? Oh, that's a good one. Um, uh, the parents from Fresh Prince of Bel Air, uh, Philip Banks and Vivian Banks. Isn't it crazy? I still know their names. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. We watched the what's the like Tim the Toolman Taylor one. 
that was one we watched a lot it was just always on uh like always like the tv was this like safety net um and i think it was also a way to kind of distract from the tension because you know in a narcissistic household you're all you're all on like pins and needles waiting for the narcissist to explode especially when rage is their currency um and so having the tv on and having this kind of like 90s sitcom thing playing in the background was just this like constant easing of the tension or a distraction from the tension i and i also realized later in life that i i would rewatch things like over and over as a child i rewatched the movie greece I'm like on repeat, just I would ha- put it the VHS and I'm going to date myself with the VHS and um, <laughs> watch it, rewind it as soon as it was over, watch it again for hours and hours and hours. Because if my mom wasn't home or she was at work, I was pretty much on my own. And I've realized now that that is actually a trauma response. Because watching the same thing um, provides safety and knowing what's coming. You know the storyline, you know the characters, there's no surprises, there's no narcissist that's going to explode in rage at you. Um, And so that was something that both my brother and I did for a long time. And while it was a comfort, it also provided some really strange narratives for me. Um, I definitely got sold into the storyline of a man coming to rescue the woman. And I would literally like use disassociation and escapism as a child and daydream about that. Um, When I was younger, sometimes it would be, you know, not a romantic thing because I wasn't there yet. Um, But as I got older, I would daydream about, you know, some man or some mystery person coming and rescuing me. Um, And of course, at the time, I didn't quite understand what I was even being rescued from because I was still believing my mom's stories. I was still believing that she was the victim, but it was an interesting tool that both helped and later on in my life hindered. So I guess the way that it makes the most sense for me to tell kind of the story of my childhood is to break it up into the different types of abuse um, rather than going chronologically, because this was the way that I have lived since I was in the womb. It's hard for me to to stay chronological. So I'm going to go through different types of abuse instead. Um, The first being extreme enmeshment, because I think it's a big piece of um, my mom and I's relationship. So like I had said before, um, I wasn't really allowed to be left alone, even when I was, you know, 12, 13, kind of coming of age. And wanting to be in my own room, listening to music and watching MTV and all that kind of stuff. Um, My mom would follow me in the room and like force me out. Um, I wasn't allowed to, you know, use the bathroom without her coming in. And all of this was used as a manipulation. It was all used so that she could basically have coercive control over my life, which she absolutely had. I would get told things like, Like my whole life, she said these phrases like, you're my sweet, which might sound kind of kind when you're talking to like a six-year-old girl, but this continued all the way up until my 20s, you know, like, you're my sweet, you're my best friend. I don't know what I would do without you. Um, I, she would say this and I've heard this a million times. I birthed you from my loins. So you're mine forever. Which is really graphic. Um, and, and then, you know, when she was in a, bad mood it would be if you ever leave me I'm gonna kill myself so immediately I was her romantic partner um and and that that was emotionally too you know she's having a bad day she's feeling insecure she um is feeling like she doesn't like her body because my mom was overweight uh I would get told about how she's so fat and she hates herself and She's not beautiful enough. And I would sit there as a child and tell her, no, you know, you're good enough. You're beautiful. I love you. All the things just constantly holding her up. Um, She's not smart enough. So I tell her, you know, how smart she is. I was her like personal little cheerleader. And yeah, enmeshment was everything. I was her. In fact, there's a really good story that 
um, kind of highlights our enmeshment. When I was maybe eight or nine years old, my mom was talking to a friend inside of a store and we were supposed to be leaving. We had some appointment. I can't remember what. And I knew that we were supposed to be leaving. Um, and my mom would get really anxious if we were ever late to something. Um, but this person was keeping her talking. And so being hyper vigilant and trying to avoid my mom's anxiety of being late, I was trying to like usher the conversation to be over and us to hurry up and get out. And so I stepped outside of the store and the door closed and I started kind of jokingly saying, ow, ow, ow. And my mom opened the door and is like, what's going on? And I said, oh, the cord is being pinched. And that was a joke that my mom actually created. And then I continued in my enmeshment as a child that we were still attached, that the umbilical cord was still there and um, we were still attached and we were the same person. And that was, that was how I was raised, that I, I am my mom. And so if she hates herself and she's fat, then so am I. And if she's stupid and the world doesn't treat her well enough, then so am I. Um, and so I internalized all that. I, I was a little girl who really, really hated herself and didn't think that she was worthy unless she could save her mother, which I could never really figure out how to do. That kind of brings us to emotional incest, which I feel like I've I've already touched on a little bit. Um, but yeah, I was groomed to be her romantic partner. Um, and, you know, we would we would sleep in the same bed when my dad wasn't around, even into my teens, which I'm not proud of saying. Uh, I even once when I was like nine years old, I wrote her a poem. I wish I had it, but I don't. I wrote her a poem about how when I grow up, my whole life mission will be to make money and buy her a house and save her. And um, she made a huge deal out of it. You know, it, to her, it was like, look, I have successfully manipulated this person to serve me. Because of that, I was also parentified. I carried a lot of the responsibility of the household. So I did cleaning. Uh, we moved a lot. We were quite poor. And um, going from rental to rental during, you know, rising housing costs. And every time we moved, it was up to me to help make sure the house was immaculate. Um, no matter how young I was, you know, this happened from as early of an age as I can remember. Um, when she had financial anxieties, which there were lots of, both because we were poor and because my mom was irresponsible with money and my dad didn't deal with money at all. It was all in my mom's control. She would put those anxieties on me. So things like, we're going to be homeless. And when my dad would leave a job, it'd be like, your dad's a worthless piece of shit. And we're going to be homeless because he doesn't care about you. And, and then it would be on me to help her find a rental and to help her emotionally through that. That was always a piece of it, the financial piece. She, she honestly, she weaponized poverty and she used it as a manipulation tactic to get me to see her as the victim. While all of that was going on, I was also, you know, being neglected. Um, like I, I touched on a little bit before, um, I wasn't taught any self-care, like none at all. And I wasn't kind of forced to do any of it like most children are. So, you know, rather than my parents being like, okay, it's bedtime, time to brush your teeth. There was no bedtime. I went to bed when I knew I needed to go to bed because I had school the next day um, and I had to do well at school or else I wouldn't be a perfectionist and then I wouldn't be a good golden child for my mom. We were always told, you know, like buck up. That was a phrase a lot. You, you're you sad about something. Uh, something's going wrong in your life. Buck up. Get over it. Uh, you got the same clothes to get glad in as you done got mad in. I got told that one a lot. Um, and then we were mocked both, you know, my, myself and my brother. Um, for anything and everything. So, you know, I wouldn't bathe because I was a child and no one was teaching me to. And then I would be mocked for being dirty. Uh, my family would call me cochina, which means like dirty little girl. And it actually has connotations of dirty with, within like a sexual context, um, which isn't necessarily how they meant it, but I think is an interesting piece as well. 
you know, if I asked for something, I needed new school clothes or binders for school or whatever, um, then I was a princess. Anything I needed automatically princess. Oh, princess wants this constantly mocked. Um, everyone could be made fun of in my family by my mom and everybody else would kind of participate in order to be on, you know, on the offense and not be the one who's getting attacked. Um, but if anyone ever said anything to my mom, she would explode in anger, um, flipping out, screaming, leaving sometimes for a day or two, telling us she's going to leave the family. She's going to commit suicide. It was always a threat. It was always, um, I'm not going to be here. And then what the fuck are you losers going to do? That was always the sentiment. And, you know, as children, I, as a child, I internalized that. Um, so verbal abuse, that's the category. That's, that was big in our family. And it was something that we all kind of jumped in on unknowingly, you know, for my brother and I and my dad, unfortunately, knowingly as an adult. So I just wanted to point out how a lot of this abuse is invisible to the outside world. And we're going to mention that you did endure physical abuse at, at a very young age, but most of what you are dealing with can be viewed as invisible. You know, this is your normal. And by the age of 10, all of these mixed messages are locked in here and your programming has been set. So how are you acting outside the home at school and things like that? And I was really good at masking um, because I think I knew internally that it would be worse for me if I if I told truth. Um, I just masked. I just tried to be I was a people pleaser. I just tried to please the teacher. Oh, the teacher doesn't want to hear about family abuse. OK, fine. I'll be the straight A student and I'll get my tiny little bit of love and attention and validation from that teacher for a minute. And those crumbs were what like kept me alive. And it it was definitely a big part of why I was a perfectionist. Um, and you know, there's there's some more pieces of that that, you know, when you're talking about the programming by 10, honestly, I think I was fully programmed by five. Um, and uh, one piece of that is because of physical abuse. So when I was very young, my mom was physically abusive. It it definitely stopped or at least slowed once I became old enough to understand how wrong it was and verbalize it. And once I became big enough to fight back because I am taller than my mom and was always tall, young. Um, but when I was little, spanking was my mom's big thing. Um she would she would even brag about it to people. Like, you know, we'd be in a place in public and I would be, quote unquote, acting up, just being a toddler, really. And she would start counting to three. And sometimes she'd do it verbally. Sometimes it would just be with her hands. And I knew that um, if she got to three, I would be picked up by the arm, dragged to the bathroom, pants pulled down and spanked. Uh, and this happened a lot when I was really little. Some of it I remember. Some of it I know from stories because my mom actually doesn't think that spanking is bad. She has no concept of that being abuse. Um, and it got to the point where that was so instilled in me, that physical fear that, you know, all she would have to do is count. By the time I was six or seven, she started counting. I just stopped immediately. All emotions off. Disassociate. Just serve her. It's not worth it. Uh, a couple times that I didn't do that when I was older, I, it you know, it still happened. She had, when I think I was nine or so, I took a pair of socks off of her dresser because we, we shared socks and I lied about it. You know, heaven forbid, nine-year-old girl in an abusive household lies. And she got so angry that she had my father hit me with a belt. And I remember my father not wanting to do it. And that was part of her coercive control over him, too. 
so yeah, the physical abuse was a big part of kind of instilling that programming. And then I think another big piece of it was uh, my mom is an expert at plausible deniability. And, you know, she, my entire life would give me an illusion of choice. So, you know, here's option A, here's option B. And then she would explain to me what those options would look like. And, you know, in a healthy relationship, that could be okay. That could be an adult giving advice to a child. In a manipulative relationship and one where there's coercive control, um, she would be shaming me into making the decision that she wanted. And then because I had quote unquote made the decision, um, no matter what the outcome was, I got to carry all of the responsibility of the decision. And so um, then if something didn't go right with what I had chosen, I could be mocked or blamed and bullied and, and the consequences were on me. I think a really good example of that, that is a big part of my childhood was cheerleading. So uh, I was taught to self-objectify by my mother. And I, when I was like six years old, I believe I wanted to join a dance class. I had taken a gymnastics class and I loved it. And my mom wanted me to do cheerleading instead. Uh, and I, you know, chose what she wanted for safety. Uh, she had been jealous of her sister, who apparently was thinner and um, more beautiful in high school and was a cheerleader. And so my whole life, my mom wanted me to be a cheerleader so that she could live vicariously through me, right? Perfect, kind of simple enmeshment story. And every single year, I hated it. You know, I was a little chunky girl and I was part brown and everyone else was skinny and loved cheerleading and super social. And I wasn't very good at it, to be honest. Like I could do the dance, but I couldn't do the gymnastics very well. Um, and then, you know, I was dirty and being neglected. And so I didn't fit in and I was being abused. And so emotionally, I was not at the same level as these children. And every single year I would want to quit. Every year, I could remember this so vividly. At the end of the cheerleading year, I'd had so much shit. I hated it. Didn't want to do it. All the kids bullied me. And I'd be telling her, I'm going to I'm gonna quit. I'm not doing this next year. And she'd say, well, it's your choice. But, uh, but remember that you're always complaining about your weight and how heavy you are. And, you know, I don't want to hear that you're fat. If you quit cheer and then you gain more weight, like, that's on you. And I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it all. If you start it all, then like, I'm going to get so angry and blah, blah, blah. And then she'd be, you know, a couple of days later, well, you're certainly not going to lose weight if you quit cheerleading. I mean, are you going to start soccer or something? Knowing like all too well that I'm not the athletic type who's going to start soccer. Um, you know, and then she'd step it up a couple of days later. In three months, I don't want to hear you bitching. I'm so fat. I've gained so much weight. I'm going to have to do cheerleading again. But you know, it's your choice. And then I would choose cheer because I'd be terrified of gaining weight and being, you know, the fat, the thing my mom hated the most. Um, and then, you know, then cheer would be expensive and I'd be called a princess. You know, you could just, you could never win. You could never serve her. Um, and that was, that process of plausible deniability ruled my entire life. Every friend I had she ruined it through plausible deniability. Every extracurricular, everything. Um, and I internalized it. I believed it was me. I believed I was the problem. I fucked everything up because, you know, I had been raised in it. Like you said, that programming was already instilled. And then I also, I also had medical abuse. And I feel like that kind of tapped into the physical part where if you're not physically safe, your mind will do crazy mental gymnastics to create a story where you can pretend that there's safety. So my mind as a child internalized all the problems and said, oh, it's all my fault. But the safety in that was, if it's my fault, I can change it. I have agency to change it. I can just be better. I can just diet. I can just get better grades. I can get a good job and make money. Whatever the issue was, I could fix it. I couldn't, of course, look at the fact that it was out of my control and I was just completely unsafe 
because I think I would have not made it mentally. Um, so yeah, that brings that brings me to medical abuse. So growing up, I had really bad asthma, um, and then I wasn't being well taken care of, so my asthma would get really bad. And my mom utilized asthma as a way for her to be the victim and kind of get points socially from other people, being like, oh, my poor baby, she's so sick, I'm so worried about her. You know, to other people, she was always just such the good mom who cared so much. And then in reality, um, you know, I'd be in the living room because when you have asthma, if you lay down, the coughing gets worse. And if you sit up, it can sometimes be better. So I'd be in the living room in a recliner trying to sleep and just coughing and coughing. And, you know, she'd be in the bedroom screaming, shut the fuck up. I do so much for you and I have to go to work and you won't shut up. And how am I going to? And, and then one time when I was four, uh, I had a really bad asthma attack. I only remember parts of this and somehow Supposedly, as a four-year-old, I got a hold of my asthma medication, which I can remember was on top of the refrigerator. And I still question how I got a hold of it, like whether or not someone gave it to me um, or even opened it because, you know, it had the child-proof locks and I'm, I'm 34 now and I still struggle with the child-proof locks. So I don't know how I did it at four, but supposedly I did. and. Um, I drank the whole bottle and I almost OD'd. And the first thing that I remember from that experience is waking up in the hospital and uh, there's people all around me trying to shove tubes down my throat. And my mom is like shaking me, just standing above me and screaming at me. If you don't let them put the tubes down your throat, you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. Why did you do this? You're going to die. But that piece of it, that genuine fear of almost dying it made a part of me switch off and and just really need to believe that I was the problem and not really even be able to look at her as the problem um yeah that was that was my childhood so your childhood is over and we've heard what has gone on in your childhood are you a person like what do you like who are you at this point and uh you know obviously you escape into tv and you're interested in those things your brother is doing his thing with video games so there's that interest there but are you just kind of a zombie of sorts that has interests or you exp- do you express yourself in any sort of way? I, I, that's a hard one, but yes and no. So I would say a lot of me is just kind of a zombie with interests or a severely disassociated person um, who is kind of living from, you know, fight to fight all of those. That being said, my what I call now my authentic self um, is a stubborn person. So little bits and pieces would come out. And as I got older, there would be certain things that my mom would do that I wouldn't necessarily tolerate. But the manipulation and the programming was so deep that she would just find like a different route. Um, And the one piece of me that I would say was was truly myself is that I started to get really into like social justice and for lack of a better word, like politics. And because I had believed my mom's like victim mentality and believed that poverty was such a big part of why she was the way she was, um, that became really important to me to make sure that like nobody had those extremes nobody was living in extreme poverty nobody had hunger nobody had any of those like big social justice issues and so that became really big to me and it kind of you know it goes back to that concept of like I needed to find something that I thought I could control in order to feel safe that little part of myself was starting to to come out um but I still think it was 
mostly stuck in programming. Um, I would still do anything that my mother asked at that point. Um, and I still spent way too much time with my mom as a teenager. Um, all my friends thought my mom was the cool teenager or the cool mom for teenagers. So like she would let us drink with, um, with her, but, you know, looking back on it, she was trying to be one of us. She wanted to be a friend, not a mother. Um, so yeah, I, a little bit of me was alive, but not much. And that little bit of me that was alive was very excited to go to college. I subconsciously knew that I needed space from her. And I only went to college maybe like an hour away from my where my parents lived. So it wasn't too much space. Like I, I wasn't allowed to go far away. But it was a little bit. Um, and my freshman year of college, I started to find, you know, a little bit of space from her and just a little bit of personal growth. Not even a lot. You know, I was still 18, 19, just the tiniest bit. And I met um, my partner, who I'm still with and love dearly and you know we fell in love and we had that whole like young romance thing so I was swept up in that and and then pretty quickly uh by the end of my freshman year I started to become sick I had um basically a pain in my stomach on my right side that just would not go away and um the pain got worse and I kept going to doctors and doctors just kept telling me nothing was there and they didn't find anything and eventually like the pain was really bad I was hardly mobile um, my digestion was completely messed up just had stopped to be honest and I was losing extreme amounts of weight um and not intentionally and I ended up being gaslit by the doctors uh this went on for nine months so I had an undiagnosed pain in my stomach for nine months. Um, this was really hard on my partner. You know, we were young and newly in love and just moved, you know, out of the dorms and into an apartment together. And we were extremely enmeshed because that was all I knew. That's what I thought love was, was enmeshment. Um, so yeah, I was, I was gaslit by my healthcare provider and the doctors. And my mom really saw this as an opportunity. This was her opportunity to sink her claws back into me and make sure she didn't lose her perfect little servant. So um, she would play into their gaslighting and, you know, she would see me get up from the room and I'd walk across and she'd say something like, are you sure it still hurts just as bad? Like I noticed you walked with like slightly less of a limp to the bathroom, you know, just little tiny things like that. But when you're already in chronic pain and coming from coercive control and being gaslit by a medical institution, that little bit seeded so much doubt in my brain that I ended up believing her and the, the doctors. And I, I honestly thought for a while that the pain was made up, that I was crazy, that I was insane. And that something was so defective about me that I could make up a fake pain that only I could feel because there was nothing really wrong. Um, and that, that situation, that gaslighting put me down so deep. It, it took away any little bit of independence and agency I was about to have being a young adult going into college and just brought me completely back into her folds. I had no power. I had no, no part of my authentic self was there because I was just so gaslit. Um, and so at the end of, you know, that nine month stint, the plan was that I was going to have an exploratory surgery that we had petitioned the doctors to let me have. And if they didn't find anything, I was going to break up with my boyfriend because he couldn't take the emotional piece of me dying we thought I was dying and um moved back into my parents which thankfully they found that I I had chronic appendicitis which a lot of western medicine doesn't think exists 
the concept is that if you have appendicitis and you don't get it treated for enough months that your appendix will burst. Well, mine, instead of bursting, it grew. And so an appendix is usually the size of your pinky finger. And mine grew to be eight and a half inches long. And it had wrapped around and attached itself to my sigmoid colon and had pinched it closed. So not to be super graphic, but if you can imagine having your colon pinched closed for nine months, what that's like, um, it was hell. <laughs> and I can laugh about it now, but it, um, it was hell. And more importantly, it was severe gaslighting with that physical threat of loss of life that just brought me right back to my mom. And, you know, after the surgery, I, I got better physically, but I didn't really get better mentally. And kind of just like my childhood, I wasn't allowed to like grieve what I had gone through. I wasn't allowed to talk about that pain or experience. Um, I was extremely isolated because of what I had gone through for the last nine months. So I basically had my partner in my life and my mom. And that was it. I had lost all of my friends because what 19 year old wants to hang out with a dying person? Like, I get it. Yeah, my mom saw this as like her way to get back. And I ended up becoming basically best friends with my mom. I talked to her, God, anywhere between two to seven times a day. And this is all throughout my 20s. And I became fully dependent on her emotionally again. So she knew everything about me. She knew what I was doing each day, how I felt about things. And she asked. And so the ask makes you think like, oh, they do care about me. But really, she was fishing for vulnerability so that she could use it against me later to manipulate me. Um, because whenever it was something that was good, she automatically didn't care. She only wanted my drama. She only wanted my pain. Um, and I continued serving her. You know, I threw her very elaborate birthday parties, expensive birthday parties, bought her gifts. I cradled her emotional state. I, you know, she was always complaining about other people in the family. I would be her little flying monkey and go and try to fix them. Um, this is kind of what I call my narcissistic please era. And I don't know if that's a term that a lot of people are used to or have heard. Um, it's something I came across a couple years ago and I really appreciate it. So if you are raised by a narcissist or in a very committed relationship with a narcissist and you yourself may not be a narcissist, but you are so embedded in their way of living that you get their fleas. So basically my mom is like infested. She's the full narcissist. And I, I had really bad fleas. <laughs> I had lots of narcissistic traits even though it wasn't my true value system. And that started to come out in my 20s. Um, my eating disorder had gone from binge eating as a child to anorexia, which is super common uh, in this kind of abuse scenario. And, you know, I used that as a form of control. I felt like I had control over something. Um, and it was also people pleasing, like my mom wanted me to be skinny so I could give her what she wanted. And my internal voice started like getting louder and more and more toxic. Looking back on it, I can understand that what I was hearing was my mom at the time. I just had internalized it all as like, you're, you're batshit crazy is literally what I told, I told myself. Um, and yeah, all day, every day, it was just super toxic, abusive voice in my head telling me nobody cares about you. Everyone just wants you to shut up. You're stupid, you're lazy, you're ugly, you're fat, you're broken. Um, I was, uh, you know, working two full-time jobs. I was a workaholic. I was basically trying to grab at all of the bad coping. And I had no concept or no way to like look outside myself to see what was going on um, because I had been so programmed. And, you know, I also, I started to, um, all of my other relationships started to mirror the relationship with my mom. I think that's the best way to put it. So, you know, all of my friends 
were using me. I was just a doormat. I was a people pleaser. I couldn't be my authentic self with anybody. I was too terrified. I, I didn't even know what my authentic self was, much less could I be it. Um, so yeah, I switched my personality from person to person. All of my bosses, every job I would choose, they'd end up being narcissistic or abusive. It was like I kept running into these same patterns. And in hindsight, I know these patterns are the patterns that my mom programmed me in. And then I started creating the patterns when they weren't there. So with my partner, I would just have intense rage, intense anger. I'd wake up just so angry every morning and just want to tear the world down. And my partner, you know, thank God is, was patient and, you know, a compassionate person, but it was toxic to him. Um, not knowingly to my, by myself, like I didn't know that I was trying to be toxic. I wasn't trying to abuse him, but that was the pattern I had learned when something is wrong and you have an emotion that feels icky, don't look at it. Don't dear process it. Just flip out in a rage and then you'll feel slightly better. And then you can go back to disassociating. And I basically, while being in extreme amounts of contact with my mom and still intense amounts of enmeshment, I was slowly becoming her. And there would be little glimpses, little bits of reality where I could kind of see it. And I would honestly be disgusted by, by myself. I'd be like, oh shit, I am becoming my mother. And it was in that kind of realization that um, I was becoming her and I didn't want to be. And in the realization that it was hurting my partner, that I went to therapy and everything changed. This, this basically brings us up to when I'm 28 years old. So in all of my life's, you know, timeline, not that, not that long ago. Um, and I went to a therapy that was called feminist therapy because I thought that that was enough of a safety net to like, be like, okay, they share the same values, you know, I'll, I'll be okay. They won't just call me crazy, <laughs> you know? Um, and to be honest, my first year of therapy was pretty bad. I didn't have a great therapist. Uh, she misdiagnosed me and she told me that I had borderline personality disorder, which I definitely have probably have traits of, or I, I had in the past, but it's not an accurate diagnosis. Um, and she told me that my mom had BDP and basically that like, I was genetically predetermined to just become her. So that really help kind of solidify all of the bad messaging that I had internalized. And I just turned into like a ball of emotion. That whole year, I was just severely depressed. I was self-harming. I had been for years before. I didn't mention that, but I was self-harming more than just the eating disorder, severe amounts of rage and anxiety. Um, so we've been talking about your memories of your life, but it took you a long time to even get to those memories. So eventually you do meet a therapist that helps you dive a little bit deeper into everything that was hidden. So walk us through this. I ended up finding my current therapist who I've been with for five, six years now and who saved my life she started by just asking questions um but not in the like searching for vulnerability to attack you way in the actual like let me hear about your childhood way and she started to try to explain to me that i was having normal reactions but to non-normal events and so my rage, my anxiety, my internal hatred, all of this shit that was huge and bubbling over and explosive in my life were not actually me being wrong or bad, as I had internalized, but me reacting to things that were really not okay in the first place. And I was stubborn. I did not want to believe her. I was like, nope, lady, you are wrong. I am crazy. I am defective. It is me. 
Like I fought her on that one for probably a couple of years, but I kept coming back because the validation was so soothing. And I don't even think I put that together in those early years of therapy, but in hindsight, I can see that she was the first person that could really validate and normalize what I had gone through. Not what I had gone through, but normalize my reaction to what I had gone through, to clarify. Um, and so she just slowly kept trickling it. And I didn't believe, didn't believe, didn't believe. But at this point, I'm still in full contact with my mom. I'm still talking to her three to seven times a day. And, you know, so she'll start to point out, oh, this thing that happened to you as a child, that sounds like like abuse or that sounds like manipulation or that is physical abuse. And then I have a conversation with my mom later that day and she does the same thing. She uses plausible deniability or she uses force of control or she triangulates family members or she brings up something really painful in my past to try to rub it in because I just told her something exciting in my life and I can't have good things if she can't claim them. Eventually, I I accepted that my mom was a narcissist, but I still couldn't give up the piece of, okay, but then I need to save her. And I would look at it as, well, look, I had all these things. I was doing some of these behaviors and look at like, I'm making progress and I'm learning about all of this. She can do the same. And so I would even, you know, I signed my mom up for therapy. I found her a therapist in her area. I offered to pay for it. I did all of it. She never went. She never wanted to go, right? They never want to work on themselves. I think that's a huge, like, differentiating point between somebody who's covered in narcissistic fleas and somebody who's truly has personality disorder and doesn't have a value system that cares about other people. Um, and. Even still, though, through all of that, I just, I wanted to save her. And then I would start to express little bits of it to her. I'd say, you know, I was feeling, I I feel like I was parentified in my childhood. And she would attack me. She'd jump down my throat and get really defensive. You're so dramatic. You always make your childhood out to be so hard. You were such a spoiled girl. You were so spoiled. Blah, blah, blah. All this shit. Um, Little by little, I just started to see it. And while this happened, I started to remember things. Then I could remember, oh, I remember that incident where I took the socks off my mom's dresser and then I got beat with a belt. Oh, I remember that time that my friend and I had a fight and my mom turned it into this whole thing and made me stop being friends with like three other girls so that I had no friends and I had to spend all my time with her. Um, I remember that time that my mom you know, through a remote, through a TV, I started to remember these things. And I started to remember nightmares. Every night since I've started therapy, but I think it went on before and I just wasn't remembering them. I dream about my mother and I dream about her abusing me. And I dream about being in the emotional state that I was in as a child, being terrified, being alone, um, feeling unloved, feeling unworthy, you know, all these things that abuse does to a child and tapping into that emotional state really allowed me to start to believe the truths that my therapists were pointing out. Um, because I was feeling it again for the first time, I wasn't just disassociating and shoving it down and then using an eating disorder to cope or using rage to cope. And yeah, I started making lists of her traits and I started checking the boxes every time I'd talk to her, just slowly proving to myself, but I still felt this obligation. She's my mother. I have to, have to, like no contact felt so impossible and honestly mean. Um, and then Uh, There was an incident that happened. I was offered a trip to Hawaii. My partner's parents um, had like come into a little bit of money and they said they were going to take the whole family to Hawaii for Christmas. Christmas is a big thing to my mom. Um, She kind of pinpoints out certain holidays. Christmas is the biggest one. 
and then you know pretends that if everything can look great on that holiday then that means we're a perfect family and it doesn't matter what happens outside of that holiday and so it was a big deal for me to go to hawaii and i actually ended up flying home early from a free trip to hawaii missing out on that so that i could spend christmas with my mother because i knew that she couldn't handle it and i was still so under her control that coddling her emotions was more important than taking like a free trip of my lifetime you know like who gets offered a trip to hawaii and to me christmas also isn't a big deal i'm not religious i was like we can celebrate a different day like whatever um but i did it for her and you know she picked me up from the airport and that night she was in a mood she was pissed off already i could tell uh, she does this lip biting thing where she'll uh pick at her lip and bite it and as a child i learned that when she started to do that it meant she was anxious and an emotion was building and i knew i would start to brace um and she was doing that that night and when we got home she was mad that my partner had not come home with me from hawaii and she was really getting angry and getting more angry and something stupid set her off i can't even fully remember something about one of the cat was under the bed where it wasn't supposed to be or something and she started flipping out screaming cursing racial slurs uh all of it and she picked up one of her cats in anger and she threw it across the room and i for the first time felt what i had felt my entire childhood and it was in that moment that i was like oh this isn't safe and i can't do this um but i still couldn't quite fathom going no contact so I just started to put in space and I, I wouldn't answer the phone calls quite as often. I wouldn't talk quite as long. I wouldn't share as much. I did a lot of gray rock. I was just really boring on the phone. I wouldn't give her anything juicy. Um, and I still felt like I was missing something. Every, every time I talked to my therapist, I'd be like, okay, I'm having all these nightmares. I'm remembering all these things I'm processing all this stuff. I'm, working on my behaviors and reactions, but there's something missing. It's just something really big is missing. When I was 31. I remembered that my uncle, my mom's brother, uh, had molested me. And although this is traumatic, uh, it's not really a big surprise. My uncle was a known child molester. He's also a meth addict. And my mom kind of took him under her wing when I was about six, when her mom died. And he was always around me. And I was always told from the time I was six, your uncle is a child molester. It's up to you to protect yourself, basically. But he was everywhere. You know, he was invented, invited to all the house gatherings, all the family stuff. Like, we were alone many, many times. And I remember that, obviously, it hurt and I needed to process it. It's not a big surprise. So. You know, at this point, this is a little time's gone by. I'm now 32. I'm in kind of limited contact with my mom. Um, and I hadn't seen her in a while. And she keeps pushing for me to get together with her. So I do. And she starts to talk about my uncle. Uh, uncle and I um, I blurt out like, hey, let's not let's not talk about my uncle. Like, I don't want to I don't want to talk about him. I'm trying to set a boundary because I had just remembered that he molested me. And you know, I just I didn't want to talk about him. And so I blurt out, hey, uncle blah, 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 molested me. And immediately she says, well, I just have a hard time believing that. Because I mean, you knew what he did and we were so close. So, you know, denial, gaslighting, no surprise there. Um, and then a couple of days later, um, I'm driving to work and I see my uncle driving. Um, he's kind of circling where I work. And I'm not in contact with my uncle at this point. I haven't spoken to him in 15 years, maybe. Um, he doesn't know where I work, where I live. We don't communicate at all. So I know, and, and I know that he lived hours and hours away. So I know that my mom told him she could feel me pulling back and she was pissed and she wanted to hurt me. So she sent my molester uncle to circle my workplace. Um, I ignored him. 
I luckily was working somewhere that actually had security. So I tipped them off just because I didn't know where it was going to go. I didn't know he was still using. Um, and thankfully, like nothing further came of it. But seeing him sent, you know, intense fear throughout my body. This was the first time I had really been embodying all of the emotions and abuse that I had felt and experienced for you know, 30 years. And so that same night I go to bed and I, I dreamed, um, it was part dream and it was part memory. I basically remembered that my mom had molested me and, um, both my therapist and I believe that I regained memories at this moment because it was when it was no longer safe for me to not remember for so long. I couldn't look at it without it just completely destroying me. But when my mom had sent my uncle to my workplace, like my body took over. My brain was like, cool, that's cute. You're doing all these mind games. My body was like, no, we're not doing that again. And I had to remember. Um, I woke up with, you know, a flood of memories, some of which were new and some of which I had already recovered, but had not kind of realized that they were sexual assault and molestation. Um, and, you know, I, of course, call my therapist immediately and it, this big kind of crying, hysterical, like, aha moment, like in that moment, everything made sense. Oh, this is why I have fear of intimacy. This is why I have an eating disorder. This is why I need to mask all of it. This is what I needed to fucking remember. And so at this point, um, I start discovering that there is something called MDSA and it stands for mother daughter sexual assault. And, um, I just start reading other people's testimony. Basically I read you know, I read a book about it, but there's not a lot out there on this topic in particular. Um, and where I really found a lot of information was actually the Reddit sub for MDSA, which if this is something that affects you, I highly recommend it. But I also recommend it with like a thousand trigger warnings. But um, I started kind of consuming that information pretty rapidly. Um, and I learned the difference between covert and overt sexual assault, which I really did not understand up until this point. So I think the common understanding, or at least what I thought, was that covert abuse was kind of lesser abuse, um, like it was light abuse, and overt abuse was, you know, the really bad stuff, like rape, for example. Um, what I came to understand is that that's that's not true at all. Um, covert abuse really just means that it was done in a way where there's plausible deniability. And it's very common in mother-daughter assault because the mother-daughter relationship is already so close and because we are such a gendered society and there is an assumption of the same gender there. Um, that a lot of the things that happened to me could be seen as my mom has some kind of plausible deniability. And, you know, I'll get into some stories, I guess, to explain um, without too much graphicness. So, like, for example, uh, when I was like 12 years old, you know, I'm, I'm young, but I'm not a child, a, a super young child. I'm a preteen. You know, I should have a little body autonomy. And I got a yeast infection really, really bad. Um, and I'm, I'm talking to my mom about it and she says, okay, well, let me look at it. Didn't think anything about it. Like that was my normal. Um, and then she takes it to the next step. Let me touch it. That's not normal. That's abuse. That's not necessary. She's not a doctor. She didn't need to do that. Um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to use, and there's like kind of lighter things. I wasn't allowed to use a dressing room alone, even into my 20s. You know, I would be a 27-year-old adult and I'm at a thrift store with my mom and it is just known because I was programmed by her that she comes into the dressing room with me and watches me fully undress. That's normal. 
Uh, same thing with the bathroom. The door was always open. I was not allowed to lock the bathroom door. Every time I went to the bathroom, mom followed me in. Every time I was using the shower or in the bathtub, mom followed me in. It was almost like when she preferred to have a conversation with me and looking back on it, I can understand it because it's when I'm the most vulnerable. Um, she would talk to me very explicitly about sexual content from a very young age, um, including what sex was like for with her and my dad. She would talk about it. She would um, talk about masturbation. She'd talk about who she was sexually attracted to or not attracted to and why just like way too explicit you know starting at the age of maybe four or five like as far back as I can remember because remember in my mom's mind I am simultaneously her best friend her daughter her romantic partner and her all at the same time uh, she would creep up on me when I was a teenager and masturbating she would try to watch. That's, you know, that's not normal. Uh, she would grab my body. This is my whole life. You know, she'd grab my ass, my boob, my hair. And she would exclaim, like, that's my hip. That's my body. Um, almost like, like domestic abuse, almost like an abusive romantic partner. Uh, anything physical had no boundaries. Um, and, you know, when I first came to terms with this, there's, there's so much shame. There's so much stigma around sexual assault. And then there's even this like extra layer of stigma around mother-daughter sexual assault. You know, I had to process the like, this isn't my fault. Like, I didn't know any better because I did. I did kind of give her permission. I mean, not really. You're not giving permission as a child, right? But in my mind at first, I was like, oh shit, I kind of did. Is it my fault? No, it's not. I was groomed. I was molested. Um, you know, it was really about full enmeshment. And, and I had to remind myself when I was first processing this that sexual assault is not about sex. It's not about pleasure. It's not like my mom was getting off on doing this. She's getting off on the control and the dominance. And yeah, it made me realize that as a child, my body, it was not mine. It was hers. And so I had to create a false narrative in my head to protect myself because I, I don't think I would have made it as a child if I really looked at all of this straight on. So after I came to terms with uh, the sexual assault, the MDSA, mother-daughter sexual assault, um, I, I really put like immense amounts of distance in. And I think, you know, a lot of people will probably be asking like, why didn't you go no contact at this point? Um, I was honestly terrified of a smear campaign. Uh, I think at this point I knew that no contact was coming. I just wanted to kind of plan it out so that the least problem came out of it. Um, and I didn't really have like a true plan of what that was going to look like. This brings us up to November of last year or October of last year, 2022. And I, I reached out to the podcast and I was like, you know, I want to tell my story. I had been listening to the podcast every time I would start to not believe myself um, or I'd start to gaslight myself or be like, oh, it wasn't that bad. My mom, she does love me. Maybe I would listen to this podcast. And then I'd be like, oh, yeah, no, I hear my mom and this person's story. Nope. And I could hear it for the other person. So it, it really helped me, like, accept the abuse I had gone through. So I realized that I wanted to tell my story specifically about MDSA because I, I had not heard anyone talk about that before. And I know it's happened to other people. Um, and then that's when I had the seizure. And uh, when I had the seizure, one, it made me realize that I, I needed to pause on recording the podcast until I could kind of rule out epilepsy and take care of my health, um, which I'm glad to be able to be here now. And more importantly, though, it, it just made me realize how physically unsafe I am around her and just how deep these wounds are. 
it kind of made me realize that I wasn't invincible to it. I think I always try to just push, 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 push. Okay, we're healing. Keep, keep going to therapy. Keep pushing. New thing to process. New thing to process. It's almost like I'm trying to rush through the healing process. And I realized because of the seizure that I was doing everything but the one thing that really needed to happen. Uh, so I went no contact. I, um, I wrote my mom a really short and sweet little letter that basically said, like, I love you and I will always love you. And I know that being around you is not good for me. I told her that I had a seizure and that I needed to focus on my own health. And, and then I blocked her and uh, I haven't spoken to her since. Um, I am still in contact with my father, which is tricky and interesting. Uh, my parents are still together and my dad basically is completely isolated. He lived alone with my mom in a city where there's nobody else except for my aunt, who is also under my mom's thumb. And so I don't get to talk to him very often. And honestly, when I do, it's a lot of like, how's the weather? Because if we get into anything deeper, he either becomes a flying monkey and tries to, you know, bring me back into her rope. You know, I've had a couple attempts of that. You, oh, she's sick and blah, blah, blah. I'm not, I'm not buying any of it. I'm not doing it. Or he honestly will just kind of like tap out and get quiet. You know, if I talk about anything real, anything that really happened, he's just silent. Um, it's like he can't acknowledge it because then it would make him fall apart and have to leave her. And for him, you know, he's almost 70 and he has been under the control of a narcissist his entire life. And she runs all of the finances. Like he, I don't know how he would survive unless he came to me and I took care of him, in which case yet another person is just taking care of him. And that's not even really what I want to do. So, you know, I don't really have expectations for my relationship with my father. Um. I don't expect him to ever be a father. He can't. And I still have to mourn that. Um, I'm still grieving that to this day. But at this moment, like real low contact with him is working for other reasons because, you know, I can then gain information about like my grandparents and and stuff like that. Um, but I wouldn't say that we have much of a relationship, which is unfortunate. I do hold out the tiniest bit of hope that she'll die first. And then we'll see. But even in that scenario, you know, I can't, I have to grieve my entire family because both sides of my family have maternal narcissists. Everyone, and I'm the first one to break out of the cult on either side. Um, when I started to break out and when I went no contact, I realized that like, I'm really, even though I'm in low contact with the rest of my family, I, I don't really have a family. They're never going to be able to be there for me and be emotionally supportive and have like a genuine relationship. And you know, that sucks. It does. I'm not going to lie, but, um, I am so grateful that my partner has like stuck it out through all of this trauma healing and I can now you know create my own kind of family um with him and, and our cats and, and all of our plants um and and I'm really really grateful too that since I've gone no contact um it's kind of opened a door for my brother and I really was in the process of grieving you know, losing my brother as well. Um, but when I went no contact, he started reaching out a little bit more. And, you know, that's very rare for him because in my family, everything goes through the maternal nerve. So everything goes through my mom. Um, and he actually came with, he has a son and he came and visited me uh, around Thanksgiving last year. 
and we talked like pretty openly about some heavy stuff. And I shared why I was going no contact. And I, I think it was the first time that I had really laid out on the table, like everything I had learned and discovered because I was finally at a place where I could do that without it triggering me. Um, and I don't think I'd ever really been that honest with him because I hadn't been at that place before. And, you know, during the last couple months, he's made some massive breakthroughs. Um, you know, he's, he's owned the ways in which he's had narcissistic fleas and kind of continued the patterns. Um, we've talked about like childhood trauma together. We actually had kind of a breakthrough conversation. It was like a four hour like video call where we ended up, you know, just like bawling, like the real ugly kind of crying, snot pouring from your nose, like the kind of healing guttural cry that we all need sometimes. Um, and really like even getting down to the like, oh, when, you know, when I was a teenager, you took sides with mom on this and, and kind of like airing some of the resentments and and calling them out for the triangulation that they were and following the source back and every time realizing that it was always my mom. Um, and so, you know, it's only been, it's really only been a few months. And to be honest, like, I, it's going to take time for that trust to continue to build. But I'm so like, hopeful for him to have his own healing process and all of this. And, you know, he's even said, like, without you doing this healing process and going no contact, like, I would have never I would have never done this. I would have never started this work. I would have never started this journey, which I almost even struggle to like fully take in because it feels like too much. But I'm just, I think I'm just so grateful that my breaking of this generational cycle and my no contact has created like just enough of a crack in my mom's cult that my brother can even like envision a path um you know and now it's it's up to him as an adult to to make that path but you know no contact is great i'm not gonna lie <laughs> i love it and i know for a lot of people it can be really hard and there's a smear campaign and i definitely have a smear campaign going on against me and i just have to not care and and not caring has been like the most freeing thing um not caring if the rest of my family thinks that I'm a horrible daughter like I don't care and I hate to say that it took me remembering the MDSA or the assault to get there but it did I needed to remember that piece to kind of like wash myself of or absolve myself of like any attachment to it and I don't necessarily recommend that for other people. If you can get there earlier, please do. <laughs> but that's what I needed for myself. Um, you know, and I, I, I have been diagnosed with CPTSD. Um, and I, I do, I do struggle with it daily. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to like romanticize kind of like the end of this because it's so much better to know and it's so much better to be able to take it and to be no contact and to kind of wash myself of the narcissistic fleas. Like, yes, do all of that. And PTSD sucks. It's hard. Every day I deal with it. Like, live in fear. I still have hypervigilance, but I can name these things and I can look at them in reality rather than just internalizing it. And that's huge, you know? I'm probably gonna be working on this and processing and grieving and healing for like the rest of my life. Um, you know, not everyone's healing story is that way, but for me, like I, I've been being abused since I was in the womb. So I now kind of look at the rest of my life as like, discovering out discovering myself and like building out my own identity that isn't tied to her um and that's a way that I can kind of find like some 
some joy and growth in that and not just be stuck in the like, oh, I'm going to have PTSD forever. Um, but also like, wow, I can really, for the first time, have a little bit of freedom. And, and that's huge. That's huge for me. And if you had any words of wisdom for everyone listening, what would it be? Yeah. Um, okay. A couple of things. I think the first is around MDSA. Um, if you, if you have a feeling, a thought, an intuition, just kind of a weird feeling in the pit of your stomach that maybe this happened to you, um, first of all, talk to your therapist, talk to your professional, you know, do this trauma informed, uh, don't have a seizure like I did. <laughs> um, but when you can handle it, I do highly recommend the Reddit sub for MDSA. Um, and, you know, as corny as it sounds, like, believe yourself. I did have thoughts about it. Honestly, the first time I ever considered that MDSA had happened to me was when I watched the movie Precious, which does talk about mother-daughter sexual assault. And I shoved that down so deep that, you know, it didn't come up until 10 years later. And I could have started processing this a decade ago. So, um, yeah, if you think that that this like could have happened to you or did like believe yourself, research it, there is support. Um, and even if it didn't and it didn't affect you, like to the extent that it seems appropriate for you to research it, I think the more we can talk about MDSA and just like help shed light on like the common forms of abuse and tactics and like the difference between overt and covert, like it just all helps bring survivors out of like the shadows of shame. Um, so yeah, that's the first one. Uh, the second one is going to be go to therapy, which I think a lot of people say, but also find a good therapist, um, which I want to validate can be really hard. And, um, you know, I think your therapist needs to kind of have some shared like life values and morals. Um, it needs to be someone that you can not just like get into the deep, like daily details and like abuse, but like go to some like existential stuff and get kind of far out there. Like, I think you really need to find the person that matches well for you and can help you on your own healing journey. And then the last, I guess, words of wisdom is going to be, uh, what is now my new life theory which is basically that our culture is so good at rewarding narcissistic behaviors that I honestly believe that if you are not actively working against narcissism, um, that you're somewhere on the spectrum for it, that you're either somewhere on the spectrum of being a narcissist or you are somewhere on the spectrum of being abused by a narcissist. And this has saved me time and time again when I'm entering like a new relationship and someone has a trait and I'm just not a hundred percent sure. And I can stop and identify that they're somewhere on that spectrum because they're not actively working against it. And I know, you know, there might be some pushback on that, but, um, it's ring true in my life. And at least here in America, I believe that it's true. Uh, I haven't been anywhere else, so I can't speak about other countries, but, uh, I think our culture really rewards narcissism. So if someone's not working against it, um, be careful with them. Well, Venus, I really want to thank you for being here with us today, sharing your story. Not too many people would have come back to share their story after uh, what you went through when it came to uh, going through our process, uh, but you did because you really just wanted to educate everyone in our community, validate everyone's experience, uh, specifically when it came to mother-daughter sexual assault. It's something we haven't covered on this show. It's something that no one really talks about, and you really wanted to get the word out on it, and I really can't thank you enough for being here with us today, uh, sharing your story, being so clear with everything, and you just really uh, did a, a great uh, service for everyone. So I can't thank you enough for, for being here today. Yeah, thank you for having me. 
Well, thank you once again, Venus. And if you want to be a guest on our show like Venus was today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. At top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. There you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. Also, at our website, we have a support group. So if you need support, please do go to NarcissistApocalypse.com. At top of the page, there's a button that says Support Group. There, you'll see that we have our very own safe social network. Inside, you'll see that we have Zoom meetings every Wednesday night, Thursday afternoon, and Saturday nights. We have forum boards for you to post on to get the validation you need from other survivors just like you and for you to give validation to survivors just like you, too. And it's just a great group of people in our support group. So join our group today. And if you need even more support, please do visit our friends at domesticshelters.org. At domesticshelters.org, they have articles and resources to help you make sense of what you're going through. They have every phone number, email address, and website address for shelters and agencies, no matter how big or small your town is. Domesticshelters.org has it there for you. And that is it for today's episode. So for myself and Venus, we hope you have a good night.